Well, the ice fishing gear is tucked away and the camo is back out of the closet. We'll follow some turkey hunters on their successful hunts. And part two of our canoe restoration. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. If you're a hunter in the UP, April and May mean turkey season. The wild turkey is our largest game bird and is a streamlined version of its domestic counterpart. Adult hens weigh 10 to 12 pounds with gobblers frequently attaining weights over 20. Despite their size, their powerful wings can propel them at speeds of over 50 miles an hour. But unless startled, wild turkeys usually prefer to travel and escape danger by walking and running. The feathers of the wild turkey are beautifully iridescent. Gobblers differ from hens in that the breast and body feathers have black rather than brown tips, thus accounting for the overall darker appearance of the males. Adult males and a small percentage of females have a beard which sticks out from their breast. Although it looks like hair, the beard is actually a modified feather. Beards usually grow about 3 to 5 inches a year to around 9 inches long, with the longest ever recorded at a whopping 18 inches. Turkeys with multiple beards are not uncommon. Another feature is a spur on the inside portion of the leg. In females, only a small knob is present. On males, spurs serve as a way to fend off other males when they spar for dominance when gathering a harem of hens. Spurs grow at a rate of about a quarter to a half an inch a year, and usually top off at about an inch and a half at four years of age. Spurs can be used to help determine a turkey's age. Less than a half an inch would be a turkey less than a year old. A half an inch to an inch, one to two years. An inch to an inch and a quarter, two to three years. And over an inch and a quarter would be a bird three years or older. Each turkey has its own unique voice, which is how they recognize each other. They have outstanding geography skills with the ability to learn the precise details of an area over a thousand acres in size. Turkeys have five to six thousand feathers. Like peacocks, male turkeys puff up their bodies and spread their elaborate feathers to attract a mate. From the neck up, the area of bare skin on the turkey's throat and head vary in color depending on its level of excitement and stress. When excited, a male turkey's head turns blue. When ready to fight, it turns red. And that long fleshy thing draped across the male's beak is called a snood. It's just another feature that helps attract females. Though turkeys don't see well at night, their daytime vision is impressive. A turkey's eyes are spaced far apart and are on the sides of its head. This gives a turkey a visual field of 270 degrees, compared to our own 180. And unlike our eyes, which are unable to focus on things in our peripheral vision, a turkey's eyes can focus clearly throughout its entire field of sight. Those eyes, along with the turkey's ability to rotate its neck all the way around, enable a turkey to spot a predator or hunter from a mile or more away. Because its eyes are on the sides of its head, the turkey lacks 3D vision. It compensates for this by bobbing its head to approximate depth perception. Turkeys also have seven different types of photoreceptors in their eyes. This gives them excellent color vision, as well as the ability to see light in the UVA spectrum. As a result, turkeys see the phosphates found in many laundry detergents as a bright fluorescent blue. So if you use one of these detergents, you may as well skip the camo. You aren't fooling the turkeys one bit. So how do you fool a turkey into shooting range? Here's a look at a couple of turkey hunters who have figured it out. Well, it was a successful morning, as you guys can see. Um, we got a turkey and it was an exciting hunt. So it started with last night, uh, Nick Sexton was with his buddy in the property that we were hunting and they kind of figured out where they're roosting. We got in on the birds last night, been sitting on them for a couple days trying to figure out where they're at and starting to get their patterns down, went out this morning and before we even got out of the car, they were go going crazy on all sides of us. We heard gobbles from everywhere, it was crazy, the amount of toms on that property. So we tried to get a place to sit and figured we got a good spot, sat down and called for a while. Cody was working them thing, working the birds and trying to get them to come in and answer in, but we couldn't get nothing close. I was calling back and forth 
and there was a lot of gobbles. We heard a few different groups of toms or jakes, and they were gobbling back and forth, and then we heard some hens, so we figured that they were henned up. So what we did, we set up on the edge of a field, and I used one of my crystal calls that I actually got from Curtis Grundon. When I cut with that certain call, those hens get very angry and they usually come in. So I figured that's what I need to do. And after a half an hour, I kept calling and here and there I would chirp back to them and that hen would cluck and I knew she was interested and they're very territorial. So next thing you know, it was a half an hour later, those toms kept getting closer because they were with those hens. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. Nick Saxon, one of the buddies, we I wanted him to shoot with his bow first, and that was the plan. We saw those three toms come over the hill with those two hens, and they're a full strut and they came in, put on a show for us. Those hens were very angry and they came into the decoys and I was telling Nick to shoot. Got one in for me, finally got a good shot and I was trying to get a shot with the bow and uh, busted me, drawn back on him. He kind of quartered away and tried to take a shot. He was in between pins and ended up shooting just low with the bow. I figured that was my opportunity to fire a few shots off at him. I dropped them and I got them, so. <sighs> With the two hens we called in, we called in two toms and one Jake. The one Jake had about an inch and an inch and a half beard on him. And the other tom, other than this one, had no beard, it froze off this winter actually. And Nick wanted to shoot the one with the beard obviously, so that's the one he shot at. This is the same one, and the beard's probably about eight and a half inches. The spurs are an inch, inch and a half maybe, so he's, he's a nice bird, probably two and a half, three and a half year old bird. And he's definitely was probably the more dominant one of the group that we shot, so. Lucky Cody was there on the ball and got him with the shotgun right after, so it was a good morning, had a successful hunt, and hopefully we'll go out next time and be able to stick one with the bow. I'm happy we had a successful hunt. It was a very interesting morning, and I'm very happy, so. Cody and I were going back and forth tonight about whether or not we should go out. It was a little windy and kind of cold. Looked like it might be raining. But we decided to go out anyways. And uh, biggest reason why was just increase our chances. We went out to a spot he's been scouting for a while now and he knows there's some birds and where they've been uh, roosting. Set up some decoys and uh, right away Two of the toms came just running at the decoys. And I wasn't, I was almost not ready to, <laughs> to take the shot. But I don't know, luckily uh, fate stepped in and they turned around, kind of went back towards the rest of the hens. They circled around and ended up coming back again about 15 minutes later. And they were a little tentative at first and the toms were kind of hiding behind the hens. They didn't really want to come out and say hi. They were getting farther and farther to my left and I was running out of a window to shoot through. So I decided as soon as I could see that head poke through, I'm going to take the shot. <laughs> Just so happy the head's moved at the right time and as I pulled the gun up, the Tom kind of poked his head up to see what he was 
you know what the movement was and uh, perfect shot and took him down. Here we go, Dwight. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, this is my first turkey ever. I can uh, thank Cody here for getting me into it, going out and filming him first time where he was shooting and I was filming. Now we kind of traded roles. But uh, yeah, big thanks to Cody. He's he's good at what he does, calling him in. Learn from the best. <laughs> It's time to make you hungry. Brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. It's been rebuilt, patched, varnished, sanded, and sanded some more. Tonight we'll see a major transformation in the 100-year-old canoe. We'll see it go from this to this. The canoe has made the journey from Marquette to Boulder Junction, Wisconsin, into the shop and masterful hands of Dave Osborne, owner of Little Lakes Canoe Restoration. It's time to canvas the canoe. This is the uh, come along apparatus that I've come up with to, to help stretch the canvas. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do it, but this happens to be the way that I've been successful uh, in stretching canvas. The other way would be to have the canoe right side up and stretch it a different way, but this, is, this works for me, so that's what I've gone with. Uh, it's tied off on the other end of the workshop at, with a, uh, another eye bolt in the, in the wall there and an eye bolt here. Made a sandwich out of two by fours and clamped the canvas together and just <clears throat> pull it uh, with the come along and typically I get about one inch per foot of stretch. Um, so on a 16 foot canoe I might stretch that canvas 16 inches which is seems like quite a bit. Right. And once you start stretching the canvas you really start seeing the shape of the canoe again and it's uh, it's another step closer to the finish thing and uh, it's one of the most exciting parts because it really starts looking like a canoe again. When Dave talks about this, the shape of the canoe, one thing about these canoes is a real drastic um, taper in. It's called tumble home. And if you look at this canoe here, this one has less of the tumble home than what the B.N. Morris has. And I, I, I think that one of the things that makes a B.N. Morris a real elegant looking canoe is this tumble home the way it um, is on the boat. This is a, an upholsterer's tool and I use that to grip the, the canvas and stretch it tight 
across this way, across the hall. A couple of stainless steel staples. Uh, about every four inches. Use a half inch stainless steel staple because it's a wet environment. Uh, you don't want your staples to rust, uh, your canvas will fall off. The traditional method would have been to use uh, brass tacks. Uh, that's what they would have used in the factory. This is easier, quicker, especially for one person. You just want the teeth on that tool to grab the canvas. Yeah, sometimes they go all the way through, but you don't have to. It's just, uh, just something for you to grip. One of the things that Kathy talked about on the, on the last video was um, how um, often people um, get a boat like this and they'll come to somebody like Dave and the exact same thing that's happening here now is he's showing me how to do this. And that's one of the neat things about this whole process is um, having people like Dave that are willing to show people how to do this. You want to start working back the other way, Craig? Uh, back this way, okay. <laughs> Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for Premier Power Sports products. The canvas process is only a slight improvement over uh, what was originally birch bark. Um, actually, there were Native Americans. Once canvas became available, and birch bark became scarce, uh, Native Americans were were using canvas on a traditional birch bark type of build with the same methods, only using the canvas as a skin. It's basically artist canvas, number 10 uh, a double filled artist canvas. Uh, I buy it from our art supply house. Native Americans, uh, once nails and screws became available, they use those in the birch barks as well. So uh, this is only a slight improvement over the Native American build. And that's pretty much it for stretching it lengthwise, stretching it widthwise. Now it's a matter of putting the seam on the end. As I put some cheater tacks in, or staples, um, to hold the, hold the stretch because we're going to release. We have to release it from the uh, apparatus. Well, we got to make a cut right down the keel line. Start at about, you know, where it's tight still to the to the hull, to the stem here. Mm -hmm. And make a cut. And I apply a sealer underneath for two different reasons. One, it seals up the joint, and the other thing is that it uh, it's waterproof, and it, it's a uh, sort of a adhesive as well. We'll do it. We'll, we'll go halfway on both ends and then we'll turn it over because it's a lot easier to work upright than it is to be stapling while standing on your head. Okay. Back in 1999, I acquired a canoe. Actually, it was in the mid-90s. Acquired a canoe from my sister-in-law, had it in her barn. I thought it was pretty cool and I'd seen a group from the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association and what they could do with old canoes, so I thought I could do that. And uh, well, I couldn't. <laughs> uh, I, I picked away at it and kind of floundered and then they finally found a course at North House Folk School in Grand Marais, Minnesota. And took a week-long canoe restoration course, fixed that canoe up and uh, I looked for one right away as soon as that one was done. That was 1999. Um, did it as a hobby until uh, 2007, and uh, I've been doing it full time since then. So, uh, love for things from days gone by, and love for the outdoors and paddling and the kind of quiet places you can get with canoes. Uh, that, that's all appealing to me. So it all it kind of worked out. You want to really scrub it, get it to soak in goal is to get it to uh, soak in and absorb or uh, encapsulate as much of the cotton fibers as possible. There's a little bit of a sizing with, on, uh, on the canvas which 
is an aid for the canvas production, but it, it does create a little bit of water repellency. So it's, so you gotta kind of scrub to get this stuff to soak in. It, uh, yeah, this is what creates the, the waterproof barrier. You do three coats of the, uh, the, the, the filler, which in this case is, happens to be red, and then uh, three coats of, of a primer. And then the color of the canoe goes on after that. And generally it's four to six coats of color. So there's a lot of, a lot of coating on top of the canvas. C, C red, Kirby C red is what the final color is going to be this and I would like to try to put a stripe on it, a cream color stripe or something like that. Well, there's, there's the six coats of this and then you get that done and then um, you start putting on the probably five or six coats of paint. Um, and then after that um, is putting the um, cap rails on. The seat is ready to put in now. But the cap rails are going to be the biggest project, getting those shaped. I'm lucky because I have another B.N. Morris in the garage that belongs to a friend of ours, and it has cap rails on it, so I can look at how those are constructed. Because the ones that were on it were so badly damaged in the ends that, you know, they're a real poor example of what they should look like. Feel free to join us on Facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.